But now this is Pastor Sunday Adelaide. Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing today? Well, greetings from Russia. Have you ever seen a black Russian before? Well, look at one. <laughs> well, I was born in Nigeria, but the Lord, by His grace and by His sovereign act, hosted me to Russia. And from there, I flew here to be part of this conference. And I want to use this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to the organizing committee of this great occasion. And uh, also be able to not just thank the organizers, but also use this uh, platform to say thank you to the Christians from all over the world, and especially to the body of Christ in the United States of America. Because if I am standing here today as a pastor from Kiev, Ukraine, it is only because that the Christians all over the world, you prayed for about 70, 40, 50, 70 years for the iron curtain to, to come down. And God answered that prayer. And so God is doing something fresh and new in the former Soviet Union. And uh, the, the topic that I am giving to address to you, to you about, which I will never really be able to address you on, because, you know, you don't speak on family for 30 minutes. But uh, I will just make an introduction. And uh, is growing a family while growing a church. I am a young man. Some people say I'm one of the youngest, uh, most successful pastors in Europe because we have the largest church in Europe now. And uh, that is at the same time while I just got married. We, I started, we started our church the same year that I got married. So they gave me the topic to address. How do you grow the two together? How do you grow a successful church and a successful family? Because in our city, in our country, it is like a legend to get to know the family of Adelaide, Pastor Sunday and his wife. So, so the Lord has blessed us to be able to be successful in one and in, in the other. But before I go ahead to talk to you about growing a family while growing a church, I want you to see the ministry and the church we're talking about. And just to be a testimony to you that it's worth it to wait on God. It's worth it to pray even when you don't seem to see any result. It's worth it to wait on God and believe God to bring down the walls of Islam just like the Lord did it for communism. No doubt he's going to do it again. And it's worth it. And it's worth it, my friends, to keep on praying for China and for the remaining Arab, I mean, uh, communist countries in the world, North Korea, uh, Arab countries. And when you see what God is now doing in the former Soviet Union, it has become, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, that the largest church in Europe is going to be coming from the former Soviet Union? It's unbelievable. But you see it, and may the Lord stir your faith. And that may it encourage us as body of Christ to come together and stand together for a breakthrough in every part of the world. Well, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, now the time and hour has come for you to address us again. We thank you for the people that have spoken to us since, since afternoon, for the men and women that you have used to minister your word to us. Thank you for the truth that you are revealing unto us. And thank you because by the power of the knowledge of those truths, we are set free to dominate, to rule, and to take the earth back for you. And now, Father, you said you confirm the words of your servants, and you bring to pass the sayings of your sent ones. You sent me here for a purpose. Now, Master, stretch forth your hand. And touch everybody. Deeper than words can do. Now the spirit of the Lord. Now Holy Ghost. Take charge of this auditorium. And minister deep and deeply. To every family. To every ministry. Transform us. These few days. That we will not just be impressed. But we will be totally changed. To go 
and be a channel of change wherever you send us. Speak, O oh Lord, for your children are hearing. In Jesus' name. And the people of God say, Well, how do you grow a vibrant church, still maintain a successful family? So that's what I'm talking about. And I'm just going to be giving you the main points uh, of this uh, message. If you want to hear more of it, I have a table down there, out there, and we have books on this subject and other subjects. Uh, Successful marriage is one of them. Successful marriage takes work. If you want it, you could get it. You'll hear more about what I'm going to be talking about. And for ministry, I've written a book that has become the best-selling book in the Russian language. It's called Pastoring or Ministry Without Tears. You can be a minister you can, and still enjoy it. And uh, <laughs> not weeping and crying. And the other book that will really help you is called You and Your Pastor. Uh, the Right Perception of the Gift of God. The last one I have here is Life and Death in the Power of the Tongue. Now, the key to having a successful marriage is knowing what your priorities are. Dealing with priorities. As ministers, we need to know that, of course, our priority is God. How do I do that? In my, in my own personal life, what I do is... Because if I don't do this, the KGB would have destroyed me a long time. But I became invisible to them because of knowing in whom I am hidden. What I do is making sure that I don't just talk about God being the priority. I don't just talk about God being in the first place in my life, but I actually act it out. We have four weeks in a month, and by the grace of God, when things became tough and communism was almost crushing me, the Lord led me to begin to do this, to prove it out to God that he is actually the priority in my life. So I begin to take one week off just to be alone with the Lord. No family, no church, no phone calls, just to be with him one week. Every week of the month, every, every, at least every month of the year I do that. And what I've discovered, people ask me, pastors ask me such a question. What does your wife say? If you go a week away out of the family and out of the church, how is this church surviving? I mean, how do you resolve all the questions? How is, what's your family saying? I said, if I don't find him, my wife cannot discover a husband. But if I could identify myself with him, if I could be with him so much, that his qualities will become my qualities. That I will be embroidment of his love and his kindness. There will only be one result. My wife, even when I don't want to go to be with the Lord, she kicks me out of the house to go and do it. You know what she says? She says, Sunday, you become better when you come from that mountain. So you cannot be God and still become and don't resemble, you cannot be with God and don't resemble him. And every wife desire to have a husband that looks just like their father. So don't even negotiate it. Don't just talk that you are a minister without being personal with the Lord. That is my priority. And my wife knows it. She knows I, she knows I love him more than her or more than the church. Because what I've discovered is, church and ministry could be addictive. And if you're not careful, to, and the only way to be careful is to have a greater addiction, greater addiction than ministry, greater addiction than, than, than lust, greater addiction than any other thing. And that greater addiction, what it could be, is to be addicted to the almighty God. I love it. I don't know of you, but it makes me excited. That's number one. Number two, I've decided to make my family my second priority. And what does, what does that mean to me? That means to me that the church is not more important than my wife, than my kids. I don't care for the church today. I'm ready to leave my church today. They said it's the fastest growing church 
in Europe. They said it's the largest church in Europe. They said it's, great. it's a great church, power-packed church, energetic church. But I'm ready to walk out of that church today just to be with my wife all life, and I will still be as happy as I am today. If your source of joy is only in what you do, you are in trouble. Because by the time you will not be able to do it, you are dead. So, some pastors I know take a week, I mean one day out of the week to be with their, in Europe it's always on Mondays, you know. I think in America too. Every Monday is for my wife. I said, so what do you do all of, what do you do all other days of the week? So with my wife, I agree that I would not, one day is way too small. So what I do, I have principles. And you've got to set principles guiding your life and guiding you to be able to be disciplined and to maintain your priorities. So what I have done is, I have, we have decided that I will not leave home before 12 o'clock in the noon at least twice a week. So twice, twice, try three times a week, I am with my family till 12 noon before I go to the, no, to the office and to the church. The second thing I do, the, other, the second part of that is I would try to come back home four times in a week before 7 o'clock or before 8 o'clock in the night. So that the whole evening before the kids go to bed, I could still be with my family and with the kids. That is the way to safeguard yourself. Because if you don't have such principles like that, <laughs> these, things, these things draw us. We get drawn by, it, by them. I mean, you sit in the office, you're ministering, or you're preaching somewhere, and you get excited by it. And you, you, you are liking it. You even soon forget that you have your wife waiting at them. That's why we must have principles and things that guide us, guide us and help us to be disciplined. Now, the, the, it is only after my family, the time with my family, that, that my church, that, come, that, the, uh, that, uh, that, 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 the, the next, at my next attention goes to the church. Of course, I spend time with the church. So how do I have a church that is as big and as successful? I mean, we are not the only church in the city. We have, in, just in 10 years after, I mean, or in the last 12 years after communism collapsed, we have more churches in the city of Kiev right now more than in the whole country of Singapore. Because when the door opened, everybody flew in, you know. Everybody came in. Everybody wanted to have a ministry there. And uh, so it's not easy. But I tell you what, if you can prove it to God that you make him your priority, if you can prove to God that he's your first love, if you can really prove it that you don't have an idol and that the ministry has called you to is not your idol, if you can really prove it to him that you love him with all your heart and your soul, and that he is the number one priority in your life, and that after him comes all the rest of the things, I tell you what, you listen to me closely, you will not need to do the ministry. He will do it for you. Now listen, when I wrote that book, Pastoring Without Tears, all the old-fashioned pastors fought me. He said, this is unscriptural. How can you be a pastor without tears? I said, get the book and read it. <laughs> right now, it's a, table, it's a table book, not just for pastors, even for members of parliament who are in the church. Because they find principles that is helping them out. You can live and enjoy life if you can put your priorities right. And you know, we all think we are serving God because we are going to preach in the church or building a great ministry for him. But listen closely. Ministering for God is a lot far more different than working with God. And the reason why that guy Enoch was taken from the earth was not because of his ministry to God, but because of what? You guess. Because he longed the secret of working with him. Priorities and they are like two legs. The stronger leg is your relationship with him. Then it's the, the other leg on which you can stand and build your ministry is your relationship with your spouse. Not even with your children now. The children come after you, the, the, the relationship with your spouse. 
some, some people get in so much into paying more attention to their kids and loving their kids more than their, their spouses. Where you miss it, right? you miss it, you miss it right there. Because it's not the same thing. Your wife was there before your kids came. And I tell you what, by the time they are gone, the kids, you know, they'll be married, they'll be gone to the, they'll be gone in the colleges. By the time, by the time they are gone, you guess who remains with you at home? The same old guy that you had neglected all these years. <laughs> You better be careful with him. Anyway, those are the fundamental things. And listen to me. You know, in Psalm 11, verse 3, it says, If the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? Because sometimes we try to be righteous. I am trying to. You know, we are religious, you know. I am trying to please the Lord. I am working for the Lord. I have no idea. No, your foundation is destroyed. Forget it. Put the foundation right first. No matter how righteous you claim, when the foundation is destroyed, even God can't help you. You remember what happened when uh, at Ziglak, when King David, you know, he really wanted to make an impression to the other king that I am sincere and I'm faithful to you. So let me go and fight with your enemies. So he went to fight. You know, for the Philippians, for the Philippines, and by the time he, and he never took care, he never took his time to secure his family. The one, the ones he left, and the wives and the children he left behind. So he went with the whole army, big guy, strong, warrior, champion. You are never really successful if you win all the cities of the world and your family gets captivated. By the enemy. You know what happened to David? He was over there trying to impress the whole world. What a great warrior he was. And guess what happened when he came back? His two wives. They were gone. Everything. And his men that were faithful to him. That were ready, that were ready to die for him. Guess what? They were ready to kill him now. And you know what David did? He, he could not maintain his joy again. But he lost the foundation. They said David broke down, wept bitterly, and he could not be comforted. Listen to me. You, you ministers, let me tell you something God told me one day. You ministers, listen closely. No matter how great a church you pastor, no matter what great a ministry you have, you listen closely. Tell you the truth. You really don't have anything.